Now let your bondservant depart, Master, according to your word in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. I took my love, took it down. I climbed a mountain and I turned around. And I saw Hello and welcome to Libations and Lectionaries. I'm Reverend Jimmy Gone, joined once again by Ted Wilkinson, which moves him ahead of Katie Schlimmer Calloway on the couch. Audience again. favorite Ted Wilkinson is back. And in the peanut gallery tonight, our wives, Katie Smith and Lindsay Jordan Wilkinson. Say hello. Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, I think the microphone picked those up. Yeah. Uh, so it is New Year's Eve mm-hmm. as we're recording. We are. Four hours and 20 minutes from the end of 2018, which, honestly, was not as much of a dumpster fire as 2016 or 2017. It, it wasn't the greatest year, but I, I didn't get fired this year. Good as a matter point. of fact, I got called to do a ministry I've wanted to do for years this mm-hmm. year, which is awesome. So I call that a promotion. It is still 2018. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So, for those of you who don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I was in D.C. at the Pentagon for the monthly Navy Chaplain Sessions Board. And this was, for me, interviewing to go from reserve component, which I've been reserve on active orders for the last year and however many months, three months, yeah, year and three months, go from that to full-time active duty. And I was selected. And at the end of July, I'm going to be going down to Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, which is kind of smells like an open sewer and I think would be fairly described as North Carolina's butthole. Uh, I'm going to be going down to Camp Lejeune to be a chaplain for the 2nd Marine Division, uh, specifically the Fleet Marine Force component which does a lot of training and garrison work, and then every so often they'll all go get on a big amphibious landing ship and go on an around-the-world goodwill tour, Mm -hmm. and, you know, if necessary, they'll stop somewhere to kick some butt. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be one of four chaplains for 2nd Marine Fleet Marine Force, Mm. and, uh, yeah, it should be interesting. Most of the time, you know, I'll just be chaplain in garrison and... Since Burlington happens to be within Camp Lejeune's Liberty Radius, if I'm not preaching at the Lejeune Chapel on Sunday morning, I can come home on the weekend. Woohoo! So yeah, it's a pretty sweet deal. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, thank Jimmy. you. Yeah. I, I will say though, for a hot minute, about 24 mm-hmm. hours, we thought the Navy was going to make us move to Hawaii halfway through Lent. <laughs> wow. That was a fun moment. Oh. Yeah. Just have to cry your eyes out on those tropical beaches, drinking your Mai Tais. <laughs> I may or may not have had to breathe through my nose between the legs. Yeah, Kate, Katie was not thrilled about it. Uh, that knife is upside down. Oh, thank you. Yep. There you go. Um, yes, Katie is using a cheese knife on Gouda. And it's, it's all good. It's all Gouda. Yes. It's all Gouda. So, Ted, how have you been? When was the last time we recorded? It good. Was right um, after Thanksgiving, right? Sometime that sounds there. right. Yeah, it yeah. was right after my wedding. It was a month <laughs> after your wedding. Yes, okay. Um, so I remember yeah. we did the, the playback for that. And, uh, yes. but yeah. So I've been well. Okay. Um, still working at Peace Church, mm-hmm. and uh, you found a new youth person. Yet? Yeah, no, no, we're still, still looking. <laughs> All right, we do have a budget, so things will be. I'm actually uh, considering maybe uh, sponsoring an episode of this podcast when we finally have a job description. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we are doing that. Uh, youth group still growing, but we did, uh, this past Sunday, I did get the, a very rare opportunity to actually go to church as no children showed up. Yeah, I saw so. a picture of that on Facebook. <laughs> it happens from time to time. Yeah. Especially the low Sunday of Christmas. I yeah. Mean. Yeah, this, this and the Sunday after Easter are the lowest, uh, attended, but. Well, yeah. it's, it's interesting. So Katie had actually preached, uh, the mm-hmm. low Sunday of Christmas in both 2016 and 2017, which I guess technically they were both in 2017. Yeah. It was January 1st and then December 31st. Okay. Um, January 1st was at my home church, Foothills Christian Church in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. December 31st last year was, um, first Presbyterian High Point? Mm-hmm. Or, yes, that sounds right. Where, uh, Lindsay Altvader Clifton. Oh yeah, yeah. He was on the pastoral staff. And everybody, all the pastoral staff was mm-hmm. going to be on vacation and Lindsay had called Katie and said, Hey, you want to do this? And Katie said, Sure. I like yeah. to exercise my preaching chops every once in a while. And then at some point 
in the fall, Katie had gotten asked again if she oh, would wow. preach somewhere. I don't even remember where it was mm-hmm. um, yesterday. And I reminded her, last Christmas, you told me to make sure you didn't preach on the low Sunday of Christmas this year. So. <laughs> and I didn't. And she didn't. Yay. And so instead, yesterday, we went and saw the Avett Brothers in Charlotte, and that was fun. Nice. Yeah. And then today, I had a root canal. That was less fun. <laughs> but hey, um, apparently, the nerve in the tooth was completely dead, so they didn't even have to anesthetize me. They just went in there with a drill and went to town. Nice. And I did not experience any pain during it. I am not in pain now. It's been all good. That's good. So, anyone else have anything for tooth talk? The recurring segment will be happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back to your point about churches hiring people. Yes. Since the last time we recorded, I found okay. out that um, Lee Hole Moses, the pastor at First Christian okay. Greensboro, where I go to church, is actually leaving at the end oh. of January. She's going to go be the chief of staff for the Reverend Teresa Horde Owens, general mm. minister and president of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which that's one of those calls that when it's offered to you, you don't say no. Yeah. Uh, especially when you are a fairly young female pastor like Lee is. Mm-hmm. You know, the unfortunate thing is that also takes a very good preacher, a very good female preacher, out of the pulpit. Yeah. Which we don't have enough of those. But, again, this is not a job you pass up. So, for all you ministers out there listening, (laughs) disciples or otherwise, if you would like to be the pastor of a very fun, open and affirming, diverse, and relatively Mm -hmm. young congregation in Greensboro... Send me an email, and I'll uh, mention your name to our friend Bailey Smith, who is the chair of personnel at First Christian and is going to be on the search committee. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. Well, you guys could do your search, like the Winston-Salem Symphony is right now, and let guests come in and visit, and then the audience votes on them to see who wins. (laughs) I mean, don't get me wrong. We will inevitably vote on a candidate, but I don't think we're going to do this like Hunger Games style. I say making an open mic one Sunday. You get, you can only get a five minute sermon. As many people that can come in and get it get it in. No, no, no. We're gonna do this like the Gong Show. <laughs> You're gonna just have gong, a bunch gong. of people all at once, and whoever sucks the most gets gonged off. Um, <laughs> Elimination rounds. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna do it that way. But that concludes this segment on church openings. <laughs> So, so many recurring segments that the audience just loves. Indeed. Just loves the list. So many it. recurring segments that we did for the first time tonight. <laughs> you know, the the segment about Ted's life, that that's fairly that's fairly common. <laughs> that's a that's a recur that is a recurring segment. Yes, so, yeah. You are once again the holder of the most times on the show now that yes. you have <laughs> Take that Katie. The, the last the last episode with Katie, Not she you. tied you up. <laughs> Different Katie. <laughs> Katie Calloway. <laughs> Uh, the last ep- the last episode with Katie, she did tie you up, and now yep. that you're on again, you're back in the lead. Yes. The important I did things. hear her. I did hear her challenge. She was she was like, "I'm very uh, was it um she's she said she was coming for you." Yeah, yeah. So she made a threat on my life. So if I die tomorrow, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, yeah, there. <laughs> That's right. It could also be my wife that murdered me for the money, but we'll never know. I believe there was a movie about that, <laughs> like back in the forties, Double Jeopardy. I'm fairly oh, yeah. sure there's a there's a entire uh, show or excuse me, entire channel called IDTV entirely devoted to the idea of people getting life insurance and then quickly being murdered. What the hell? Yeah, IDTV yeah. Uh, investigation discovery. Lindsay is a big fan of, and that's where we learned. Yeah, and Lady Gaga are huge yeah. fans of oh, IDTV. Okay. Oh my goodness! So, just the two of you, but that's a, that's a but, totally new genre of murder porn. Like, yep. That I've heard about. Well, yeah. a lot of them include the spouses, but not all of them. Sometimes you have But we did. Murders. We did learn from that from that uh, from that ch- uh, channel that uh, if you ever get life insurance, you will almost immediately be murdered by your spouse. There's no other co- – no, life insurance is purely the, the, like a precursor to murder. Fascinating. <laughs> I mean, there have been life insurance policies on me and Katie since <gasps> I joined the Navy. Oh. Um, Did you know about it? <laughs> Did Katie know about it? <laughs> See, here's the thing. I'm way more valuable dead than she is because ah. her policy is only $100,000. Oh. My policy is $400,000. Keep talking to this. <laughs> 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 
In other news, Katie's also about to come into four hundred thousand dollars. So anyway, anyway, on to the Bible. The Bible, yay! yay. We're talking about. Uh, well, interestingly, we're about to talk about a lot of murder. I, mm-hmm. Yes. I didn't know tonight was murder show. Tonight is. Tonight is. Presence from royalty show, mm-hmm. murder show, and very old church people show. Ooh, that's right. It's the we're talking about the lovely story by O. Henry, Gift of the Magi. Yeah, the no one else. Um, no? Not quite. Oh, oh, come on, that was a funny joke. Oh well. I actually do have a question before let me derail sure. immediately. Okay. What on earth does gift? Of, why is it called Gift of the Magi? There's know. there's no point in this story that would make a make a connect. Oh, you don't know the gift. Of, okay, so the, it's a old story. You probably heard it and don't know it, but it's it's uh, about this couple and they don't have a lot of money and they want to buy each other gifts uh, for Christmas. So the man sells his watch to buy his wife a comb because she has very beautiful hair. A set of and tortoise the, shell combs, that's right. specifically. And the the wife cuts off her hair to buy him a gold uh, chain for his watch. Mm-hmm. And they give it to each other and they're like, oh, poor us, but don't we have the love or something like that. Who right. knows? Yeah, uh, that, I, I have no idea yeah. why it's called Gift of the Magic. Because I yeah. haven't there's no point where it's like the 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 wise men sold all their frankincense to get Jesus some gold, and Jesus sold his decanter so that he could get them a, a box to hold their frankincense. I don't know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. I, I got to be honest, I haven't read that story since freshman year of high school literature, <laughs> so I have no idea. Okay. Local story, in case you didn't know. Yeah. Interesting. That's why there's an O. Henry Hotel in Greensboro. Well, I figured O. Henry had to be from Greensboro, given that. Yeah, you know, there's a, named a road yeah. and a hotel. Well, I mean, um, Cornwallis has a road too, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that one is interesting. Yeah. That, of course, you know, Greensboro was where Nathaniel Green got his ass handed to him yeah. by General Cornwallis. Yeah. So, but you know that the battle at uh, mm-hmm. at uh, the Guildford. Guildford Courthouse so thoroughly weakened the British army. That it contributed directly to Cornwallis's surrender. Oh yeah. yeah, because he had to go to Yorktown and then got surrounded yep. by Washington. Yep. Yes. Because he he had to retreat, even though the British won the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Mm-hmm. They had to retreat to lick their wounds, basically, and they were so depleted that when they got there, and Alexander Hamilton was sitting there with his battalion waiting for them, yeah. it's like, well, the world turned upside yeah. down, y'all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So, now that we've talked about <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything but the Bible. So what movies are out nowadays? <laughs> uh, Mary Poppins Returns. Uh, that's right. Aquaman. We saw Aquaman. Yeah. That's what did you right. think? Um, mm-hmm. Not not a whole lot of theological implications in it, but unless you believe that really you see people weird. <laughs> you, yeah. you don't say. Weird, right? <laughs> um, My take on Aquaman is that Marvel... Or DC. DC. <laughs> DC paid a lot of money to make me motion sick for three hours. That, oh, that is true. It was a very good story, I'll say that. There are several shots where the cameras are swirling around the main characters and there's like a CGI background and it is kind of, it does make you sort of motion sick <laughs> to yeah. watch it. But I will say, I enjoyed the fight scenes. I thought those were very good. Um, I know we're jumping ahead to what we're. Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa. See, but, um, that's a common refrain yeah. I've heard from uh, women especially. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm plenty of gay men. Yeah. Is that they don't care about the plot? Just give me more shirtless, wet Jason well, Momoa. Well, that's a good thing because the plot is nonsense. But it's a comic <laughs> book movie, man. What do you expect? A comic book hey, movie about Aquaman. You know what? It's fairly good, and for DC, that's knocking it out of the park. <laughs> so, I mean, let's be real. They have made one truly good movie so yep. far in Wonder Woman: Suicide Squad. No. <laughs> Um, I would go so far as to say that was their worst one so far. <laughs> That's a good good try, yeah. Um, you know. So, so anyway. Anyway, back to the story. So we're going to be talking about two different passages, basically. Uh-huh. One from Luke chapter 2, about the dedication of Jesus at the temple, and one from the beginning of Matthew, mm-hmm. about the Magi's visit to uh, Jesus, mm-hmm. followed by Jesus and his family turning into refugees. Mm-hmm. So, let's start with Simeon and Anna in the temple. Oh, actually, you know what? We haven't talked about what we're drinking. 
That's a good point. So we skipped over everyone's favorites. Well, the libations <laughs> part. The, the one recurring segment we're supposed to have every time. <laughs> so tonight we are drinking Balcones Rumble. Mm. It is a Texas spirit, is how the bottle describes it. And there's really no other way to describe it yeah. because it the way it's made incorporates elements of brandy in that they use fruit instead mm-hmm. of grains. Specifically, what do they use? They use figs. Figs, honey, and turbinado sugar. So it's got a brandy element. It's got a rum element mm-hmm. in the in the unrefined cane sugar, and then they age it like you would bourbon hmm. in charred new oak barrels. Okay. So th- th- you really can't pigeonhole it any one way or another. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's take a look. Ooh, it tastes like whiskey. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's got a sweetness that it a lot of whiskeys don't well. have. But yeah, yeah it is, it's it's quite nice. Yeah. And since the ice has kind of, you know, released the ethanol from it, it no yeah, longer burns say. your nose hairs when you <laughs> inhale like yeah. like it did when I first poured it. Yeah, when we first smelled it, it was I was like, I got a little tipsy off of that yeah. sniff. <laughs> so, Joey, for those uneducated in the room, do yes. you know what ice does to alcohol? Sure. So. If you didn't hear Lindsay's question, she basically wanted to know what does she basically wanted me to explain what ice does to alcohol. So it's less ice and more just water. Mm-hmm. When water interacts with an alcoholic spirit, it causes the uh, the the good stuff, the flavors, to unbond from the ethanol, and the ethanol is then released and basically just floats away. Yeah. So the ethanol ex- evaporates quickly. Yes, water, right? that's correct. And so, you know, you're you're left without the burning that Ted and I both got of our nose hairs yeah. when we first whiffed this before the ice started to melt. Yeah. And you can achieve that by either pouring your spirit over an ice cube and letting it melt a little bit or just adding a few drops of water. Yeah. Um, with bourbon especially, they there is a very specific type of water that you can only get in places with heavy limestone concentrations. Mm. It's essentially limestone water, the same water they use to make bourbon, Mm. the same water that thoroughbred horses in Kentucky drink and end up having stronger bones as a result. And it actually, it interacts with the bourbon in a very different way from regular distilled water. Yeah, yeah. It's also hella expensive, and there's no reason to pay it. (laughs) Unless you are drinking like mm-hmm. Pappy Van Winkle twenty year or something, because yeah. you know Pappy, that's the kind of bourbon you don't want to mess <clears throat> with. Whereas you know your Maker's Mark or your Bullet, God, mm-hmm. you could use tap water for those and they'd be fine. Yeah, um, as long as you don't live someplace with bad tap water, like Flint, <laughs> Michigan. If you live in Flint, if it, don't use tap water yeah. in your bourbon or at all. If really. it's brown, don't put it in your whiskey. Yes. Camp Lejeune apparently has had some issues with tap water really? too, so I'm oh. looking forward to that. Oh boy. Um, yeah, apparently there was a chemical called Gen X that got into a bunch of the water table in uh, the uh, Cape Fear River Basin, oh. and so they've been having some issues with that. But – so anyway. and when you so when you put the ice into your your whiskey, mm-hmm. it melts and it it diffuses it, and that's why when you put uh, ice in your whiskey, you can always drive home. Uh no, no, no. no. <laughs> are you sure? No. Uh, y- if you are impaired, please do not drive. That will get you what I like yeah. to call arrested. Just chew on some ice, and fifteen minutes later, you're all good. No, Ted. Oh, no. What? <laughs> One alcoholic drink takes approximately one hour to process out of your system. Mm -hmm. So if you have four alcoholic drinks, you need to wait at least four hours before driving. And that's for an average grown male. Or put all those drinks into one glass because that counts as one. No, Ted. (laughs) No. Bad Ted. No treat. (laughs) Oh, no. What if the the teenagers that listen to this listen and now now they think that's the truth? (sighs) (laughs) Ted. If you're a teenager, please email in at... Yeah, if you're a teenager, you election. should not be drinking. Let's be yeah. real. You know. If you have more questions about alcohol, email Jimmy at... Jimmy Ga- Jimmy.gone at no. NavyChaplains.com. No. No. <laughs> no, you can email libationsandlectionaries at gmail.com, and it'll make my phone go ding. <laughs> anyway, so, Luke 2. Luke 2. The dedication of Jesus at the temple. Okay. You know... It's interesting what got me thinking about this particular passage a couple days ago was the Fleetwood Mac song, Landslide. Mm -hmm. 
Um, specifically, the chorus, well, I've been afraid of changing because I've built my life around you, but time makes you bolder. Even children get older, and I'm getting older, too. And, you know, it's not like a direct corollary, but I think of that, and then I think about how Simeon and Anna both spent a significant part of their lives getting older in the temple waiting for a child. Mm-hmm. And that, t- I feel like that takes a lot of discipline. Like Anna especially, um, what, it, what, the, what the Luke 2 passage says about her is that she got married very young, mm-hmm. and her husband died just a couple years into their marriage, and then she spent the next 70 years at the temple in Jerusalem waiting for the messiah that's a lot of years and she you know yeah it is dedication and basically she had made an agreement with god saying i will dedicate my life to waiting for this messiah if you will let me live until he is born same goes for simeon in fact after simeon meets jesus he says, Lord, now let your servant go in peace, because his life has been fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Again, this was somebody who dedicated their life to serving the temple in exchange for living to see the Messiah. And that, I mean, we've dedicated our lives to ministry, but that's just, that's on a whole other level. Yeah. Especially in a time where there was no Netflix or Hulu to pass the pass the time of the temple. Just watch a little on your phone. I'm glad I waited till you had a mouthful of food, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> and yeah, I, well, yeah. No, that's I mean it is a it's a dedication to a principle that not everyone at the time believed either. Mm-hmm. It wasn't this wasn't like a universally universal concept in the Jewish tradition. So um so this kind of dedication was very much to something that even to say their friends would have maybe been a little, yeah. It would have been like if someone, someone here was like, I, you know, like so their husband or wife dies and they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to just go to church every day until Jesus comes back. And we, we might be, even, even though we do believe in a Messiah, we might very well be like, that's nice, but do you have to go to church every day? Is it a thing? You know, like it's, it's an interesting, mm-hmm. yeah. It's a, it's a it's a it's a force of belief that uh, you don't hear about a whole lot anymore, or you don't not well, not always in a good context at least. It's but. interesting you mentioned that. Mm-hmm. So one of the uh, one of the guys I was at the chaplain board with last month, or mm-hmm. not last month. God, it was only three weeks ago. <laughs> not even that. Two and a half weeks. Uh. <sighs> it's been a long, long two and a half weeks. Anyway, this guy. Um, whose first and middle names were Kurt and Russell, interestingly mm-hmm. enough. <laughs> and he, he's like, good-looking dude, too, like yeah, movie yeah. star looks. And we're like, nice. how did you end up being a Catholic priest, mm-hmm. <laughs> jokingly? And he said, like, believe me, my friends asked me the same thing, because a lot of the people he grew up with are not believers at all. They're agnostic or atheist. And they're like, you have literally dedicated every portion of your life to being in ministry. And he said, yeah, that's my calling. Mm-hmm. And I think somebody like that is the closest analog we can get to somebody like Simeon. And even he has Netflix yeah. at home that he can go watch House of Cards or whatever. <laughs> you know, so it's an interesting an interesting question to yeah. ask of how how deeply you have to believe yeah. to so thoroughly dedicate your life to a proposition that you would <clears throat> live in the temple not knowing when or if yeah. you're ever going to see this child. And just having, and even especially having faith that, that you're going to see it in your lifetime. And then to be like, be so thrilled that it's finally happened to be okay to die at the beginning, like Jesus, when he's dedicated to the temple, hasn't done anything yet. He's just been born, which I would fair to say we've all done. We've all accomplished that particular feat. I, I think um, our mothers probably had more to do with that. A little that more, than we did, a little more. Our fathers played a contributing role. Yes, fair enough. But I would just say that we, you know, like it's not, it's not like she saw, you know, Jesus resurrected. It was just the Messiah has come, you know, like I'm glad I finally saw it. Now it's, right. you know, God, if you could, you know, like, 
get me off this earth. That'd be great. <laughs> well, I don't uh, think I don't think it's God. You can kill me now. More, <laughs> it's more along the lines after of after seventy years, just hang out in the temple. Maybe <laughs> I think it's more along the lines of my life's purpose has been fulfilled. Yeah, I can now pass in peace and happiness, knowing that I have seen the salvation of Israel, more or less. Yeah, you know, and given the rough time Jesus had getting so many of the Jewish people to actually believe that he was his salvation, Mm -hmm. it's pretty astounding that these two people immediately upon seeing Jesus believed that this eight-day-old child was the promised Messiah. Yeah. And I think that just goes, uh, that happens a lot in the gospel. People seem to um, dedicate their lives to Jesus based on what what in the text seems like very flimsy um, evidence. Like uh, I can't remember, who was his name? The gentleman who Nathaniel this, Nathaniel who who see who who's like I don't know who the, the, his friend comes mm-hmm. like you got to meet this guy Jesus He's like I don't know can anything good come out of Nazareth yeah yeah and, and then, Jesus actually called him on that exact yeah. thing did you believe because you saw yeah and he mm. comes to jesus and jesus is like i saw you sing by a tree and he's like oh clearly you are the messiah right. which it, if if you went if you shot that as like a movie script you're like this mm. person is insane <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's actually that's my favorite part of that text that jesus said i saw you sitting under the tree and nathaniel says oh you're the messiah and jesus immediately calls bullshit on him. yeah and so there has to be something about there has to be something about jesus that cannot be Put into words, or sure. it could not be written down, at least in the vernacular they had. Sure. Um, that you, it, I imagine it's like those people that you don't, you know, like maybe you see them on TV or you, you know, hear them on the radio and they don't seem that interesting, but you, uh, I've heard Tom, not to conflate Jesus and Tom Cruise, but I've heard like, <laughs> There are two different religions. Jesus well, of Scientology. Ty- Jesus of Scientology. No, but um, I've heard that like you know like Tom Cruise. He seems like a very charismatic guy, and he's mm-hmm. very fun to watch. Uh, break his legs and stuff in movies uh, until Which he and, literally and do, broke his yeah. legs filming the last and, Mission Impossible and doing crazy stunts until I am sure he will die on film. But um, that'll probably yeah. make him happy. Anyway. But apparently, when you meet him, he is so like he's very engaging and like just keeps your attention, even though he's not like saying anything particularly profound. Sure. He's just one of those people that has that magnet. And there are um, people like that, and yeah. <clears throat> they make good ministers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> got to say. And uh, sometimes, and sometimes <clears throat> not great people. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. not that great gift people. is not given based on virtue. Unfortunately, sometimes <laughs> they sometimes their name is Joel Osteen. Mm. Um, which, speaking of which, That's apparently, not the <laughs> apparently his podcast was recommended to listeners of my podcast. What? <laughs> which I'm like, Ooh, I beg your pardon. I hope to God that it goes the other way as well. If you like Joel Osteen's <laughs> podcast, God. maybe you'll like Libations and Lectionary. You're Joel Osteen's half million subscribers. Listen to this highly irreverent podcast about <laughs> drinking where they curse and talk about Jesus. Oh, oh, um, so I, I wanted to mention, uh, Lindsay showed me, a, uh, wrote down a little message for me that this is, uh, she, she thinks this is very similar to the, what was the name of the dog? There's a Japanese story about Hachi the dog mm-hmm. who his owner died and then he came back to the train station every day for oh, 13 yeah. years. I've heard that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a they, very great movie. I think they made an Americanized version of it with Richard Gere. They did, yeah. but you can't in really? Japan, you can actually go and see the statue mm-hmm. placed in the spot that the dog would come. So no, not yeah. people are like that. So that they come even though I've never heard not of, sure anything's coming back. Never heard of the Richard Gere movie. I oh, have heard I, I remember Hachi, seeing it. Hachi which, the dog. Yeah. 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 So I remember it, I don't think it takes place in Japan. I think they're like, let's just put it in Boston or something like that. Um, Yay, <laughs> cultural appropriation. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, it's a, the dog, you know, like, so loved his master, it kept coming back. Even because sure. uh, you can't, I mean, know. but that's, that's part of the, 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 of course, the difference, of course, you can't explain to a dog. Your ma- <laughs> your owner is dead, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. Anyway, sure. So, any other thoughts on Simeon and Anna? Were they at the same temple? Yes, they were both at the at the same There's temple at one. the same time. Yeah, it, it was it was the the temple of Yahweh in yeah. Jerusalem. The gigantic um, second temple, this the yeah. second temple that had been rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity. Um, who was it? Nehemiah was in charge of that. Sounds right. Um, 
<laughs> so, and, and that's where you went to have your child dedicated eight days after they were born, which means that's also when they took Jesus to get circumcised, as you did at yeah. eight days in the Jewish faith, and they still do at mm-hmm. eight days in the Jewish faith. Um, you just don't go to a temple for it. You... Well, well, actually, you can go, some you can of go them to a, do. You don't go I, to I mean, the temple for No, you yeah. obviously not, because <laughs> like a, a Jewish baby born in Brooklyn, they're not going to go to Jerusalem <laughs> uh, to, to have them <laughs> circumcised. That <laughs> would be ridiculous. Yeah. But a lot of rabbis are also certified as a bris. So. Yeah. Or not a bris. That's the that's the that's actual the actual, ceremony. Yeah. A moil, as as a moil, mm-hmm. uh, and they do the circumcision. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's a very ancient ceremony mm. yeah. for the Jewish people, and one that you know you can look all the way back to the Abrahamic times, and that's how long they've been doing it. Um, but that's why they would have gone to the temple to have Jesus circumcised, to have him dedicated, and to officially name him. So. You know, Mary had been told, you will call his name Jesus, and Joseph had been told that as well. But this dedication at the temple would have been when they legally designated mm-hmm. his name as Jesus. Okay. Up until then, it's like Bird Box, boy. Yes, Bird exactly. Box. Up until then. <laughs> up until then, boy. legally, he was boy. Talk about a relevant reference. <laughs> <laughs> the peanut gallery is talking about Bird Box. Yeah. <laughs> Taken over. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Well, they they paid John Malkovich and Sandra Bullock, and I can only imagine insane amounts of money. Yeah, Machine Gun Kelly was in that movie too. Was he? Yeah, and oh. I saw a very interesting meme of him looking out the window in fear, a scene from the movie, and the next the next frame is Eminem looking in the window at him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you seen Have you seen Bird Box? I have not. Katie watched it the other night, and I was uh, busy playing Angry Birds, appropriately <laughs> enough. Um, he said it wasn't his kind of movie. His, no. To be fair, it was suspenseful. It was, to yeah. be fair, I don't do scary movies, but I like Sandra Bullock. So. Yeah, fair enough. I think it was it was it was good, um, mm-hmm. but it would have been it probably would have gotten a better reception had A Quiet Place not come out the exact same year with a very similar premise. And I did um, I did and, read a yeah. number of people commenting but, on. But but apparently, but apparently the book that Bird Box is based on came out years ago. Oh, so sure. So, it's, yeah. So, John Krasinski is really the one who stole stuff. Eh, probably not. Yeah, but. but no one's going to remember that now. I mean, Disney also stole a bunch of stuff, but no one remembers that because they're the ones that made the famous version. So, what you're saying <laughs> That's is right. that in this scenario, Netflix was Dwight Schrute. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so I was back to back to the Bible. Um, okay. So Jesus is dedicated, eight days old, Mary and Joseph following the rituals. And then in the Gospel of Luke, the next thing we hear about him, he's 13 years old, he's, he's been bar mitzvahed, and he's being a gigantic pain in the ass by running yeah. off from the Passover uh, caravan to debate the priests in the temple. Well, so I, I I was actually going to do my whole Sunday school lesson about it, uh, that this Sunday <laughs> until the, the no Sunday children school show. lesson that no children came. Well, that will be done this coming oh, Sunday because nice. I'm not going to plan and do, I'm not going to throw out a perfectly good lesson. But um, the not not when I have uh, Hearthstone to play and fun and uh, late mi- last minute shopping to do. Now that there are sales on. Anyway. Yay. Um, anyway, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so I remember reading, reading that. It doesn't actually say he left. It, so I'm going to, I'm going to dictate that he was abandoned by Mary and Joseph because, because he was a little pain in the ass. No, I, I think it's more, they probably, so, so it does seem, cause in the story, it's just like Mary and Joseph left their only child, supposedly at this time, only child. Um, and then f- didn't realize it for a whole day that he was missing and then came back and then traveled and it took them three more days to find him in Jerusalem or something like Who that. That I but, never took my parents three days to find me in the library. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I get, you know, like obviously there was, they probably were traveling with a large extended family. So oh, there sure. were probably I mean, tons of kids his age well, and they pro- maybe had other children at the time. This but, would have been an annual pilgrimage yeah. to Jerusalem for Passover 
and much of Nazareth probably yeah. would have been in this caravan. Yeah, but so he he is found um, talking with the the was it the teachers and the, the not the high the priests, priests and the, the teachers priests, of the yeah. law. Yeah, yeah. So he's found t- uh, talking with all these people. Did they stay there for four days with this little kid that had been abandoned at the temple? It's possible. Where else were they going to go? Hey, you know. <laughs> Well, you think you think think about think about the story of Samuel, mm-hmm. how Hannah prayed uh, if to God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to this to your service. And then, when he was old enough, when he was about the age of little boy mm-hmm. Jesus, he would have gone to, well, not the temple yet, but this the synagogue yeah. to serve under Eli's direction. And it's possible that the priests thought. Maybe it's the same situation. Yeah. Because yeah. – And I'm not saying that it's so strange until – I want you to think about this, Jimmy. Imagine imagine you're a pastor at a church and some parents forget their child at the church and you have to take care of them for four days and this 12-year-old will not shut up about the Bible. Will just go on. and Because they show up four days later and they're mm-hmm. – I assume still talking. I mean, this could be also the first time in four days that Jesus has brought up the Bible. So I'm assuming I'm going to get to find out what that's like with Marines who don't go on leave, <laughs> like for Christmas. They just hang around the chapel to get out of work details and yeah. debate with the chaplain. Oh, fun. So we'll see. Um, do they know who's coming. <laughs> but so backing up, um, back in that gap in Luke's chronology, we do get a little more yeah. in the Matthew chronology, specifically the visit of the Magi. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have no idea how many. You know, we assume in, in popular culture that it was three of them mm-hmm. because they give the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it would be rude if there was four and one didn't bring a gift. Right. We also don't know their names. Uh, Balthazar, mm-hmm. Melchior, and Gaspar are names that were made up by the early church to give them a name. Yeah. Um, and those names have stuck. You know, Those are the names they have in the song We Three Kings. Those are the names that Christopher Moore happily uses for them in the mm-hmm. book Lamb. Uh, the Gospel According to Biff, yeah. which, interestingly, that most the first like two-thirds of that book are about young teenage Jesus tracking down each of the three magi and learning from them. It's basically hmm. an expansion. It is the Christmas expanded universe, <laughs> if you will. Uh, the the straight-to-Netflix movies that... Uh, <laughs> Man, I wouldn't mind if Netflix in made the, a miniseries out of the land. Bible cinematic universe, yeah. I, I would be quite happy if... Netflix yeah. did a miniseries based on Lamb, quite frankly. Throw us, if Netflix is listening, throw us some money and we will happily make you several 13 episode series about interesting little characters in the Bible, Man, in the biblical area. If I had the money to make a Netflix series about the Bible, I would go straight to Judges. Yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, that actually would, that would be a Quentin Tarantino film where it's everyone's murdering each you other. Could, the, People's heads are being staked to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Judges, a Netflix miniseries, could compete with Game of Thrones. Ooh, ooh. I mean, <laughs> it'd be so. If, so if you're looking for that Netflix or Showtime, I know you have an entire section of your catalog dedicated no, to that no, kind no, of stuff. No, no. <laughs> we're not gonna. We're not gonna put the Bible behind a premium cable paywall. Uh, we're gonna put it <laughs> on the eight dollar a month streaming service. Okay. <laughs> We'll also accept bids from Hulu we, and we Amazon not, Prime. <laughs> we are not the medieval Catholic Church that would only let the Bible be read in if, Latin. If Amazon can throw half a billion dollars to buy Lord of the Rings, they can give us five million dollars to make this series. Come on. Truth. Truth. <laughs> so, anyway, the Magi. Tweet at Amazon Prime. <laughs> so, the Magi, they, they come to wherever in Israel... Mary and Joseph had relocated with Jesus. Uh Matthew does not say they were still in Bethlehem. Realistically, they were probably not still in Bethlehem. They were probably in Nazareth. So all y'all's nativity scenes that have three (laughs) wise men present, biblically inaccurate, like almost everything is. Um, So they're probably back in Nazareth at this point because that's where where they lived. That's where Joseph's livelihood was. They probably took the kid, went back to Nazareth. Um, and the Magi show up in Israel. 
And where do you go when you're trying to find the new king? Well, you go see the old king. Oh, well, and, and I was, uh, talking to Lindsay about this on the way. Is it possible they just assumed that since King Herod is technically, he's, yes, he is sort of under the employ of Rome, but since he is a quote king, unquote, do they maybe just assume maybe it's his son? That's very possible. Yeah. Although his sons were insane little bastards. Oh, and they probably, and assumedly he did not have a recently born son to fall into whatever this category yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. His, his sons, Philip and Herod Antipas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Philip, who was terrible, and then Herod Antipas had him killed and then married his wife. They're all, the, all the Herods are horrible. Yeah. I don't yeah. know of any good Herods. <laughs> and Philip's son, uh, daughter, Salome. Yeah. Decided she wanted John the Baptist's head on a silver platter, and we yeah. all know that story. But so yeah, King Herod, insane. Uh, apparently had dalliances with Cleopatra, and Ooh. I am I, I kid you not. When I was in high school, I learned I, I heard this narrative about a love triangle between Herod, Cleopatra, and Mark Antony, oy, and it's oy, like oy. what in the hell. Now, did he actually have some sort of fling with Cleopatra, or is this the equivalent of you don't know my girlfriend? She's from she's a model in Canada, and that's why you don't see any of her pictures. Is this the same thing where he's like, you don't know my girlfriend's Cleopatra? She's in Egypt. You wouldn't know her. She's just the most beautiful woman in the empire. <laughs> so, Shut up, guys. Here it sounds like a cross between Mr. Mackey and Napoleon. That's <laughs> what you're telling me. Yes, exactly. Sure. All right. So, Gosh. so, so apparently, Herod has some <laughs> sort of complex about. I don't have his, any his insul- girlfriend who lives in Egypt, so he's already feeling yeah. inferior when these magi <laughs> show up. And they're like, "Where the new king at?" And he's like, Hi. "The fuck you say?" <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and that so yeah so they show up and I was cu- curious about this because um. Skipping a little ahead, Herod yep. uh, orders all the ch- when they when he finds out the the magi aren't coming back that they mm-hmm. just went that they back skipped to town somewhere East Persia, former Babylon, That's somewhere like that, magi. wherever we'll, they're from. We'll assume not Beijing or Shanghai, but um, hey, you never know. Yeah, I mean, that would be. Well, Were you uh, there? Yeah, because <laughs> I sure as hell wasn't. Touche, Jimmy. Um, but no, the uh, so anyway, when so he he orders the execution of all children. Two years and under. Right. Does this imply that the Magi were traveling for years? Not necessarily. What they said was, we saw the star appear at mm. thus and such date, which would have been two years prior. Now, that it might have taken them some time to study that, figure out what it meant, and mm-hmm. then set off. But if they did come from Eastern Asia, if they came from, like, say, India, yeah. or even China, let's, let's say that's yeah, a possibility. Yeah. Or Russia. You know, Russia was settled at the time, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it could have easily taken a year for them to travel overland mm-hmm. that far. Because um, they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have... Well, they did have they highways. Camel but Express. They, <laughs> they, they, had, they did have roads, but they didn't have improved roads like we have now. And they sure as heck didn't have cars. Yeah. They didn't have trains. They had boats, but not ones that you would want to sail from India... To Palestine, yeah. and, uh, especially since the Suez Canal didn't exist at the time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it could have taken them a very, very long time to get there. And so, yeah, so they find out uh, that Herod has no idea, and he says, go and find this quote-unquote king, king so quote, that I yeah. may come and kill, I mean worship him. Yeah, exactly. Um, I am and, not the bad guy in this story, yes. no. <laughs> and so they go, they worship the king. Yep. They leave the gifts, which, my God, the number of interpretations I heard about those growing up in my private Christian Oh, school. really? Oh, boy. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, they leave their gifts, and then they have a vision that says, do not mm-hmm. go back to King Herod. Go home a different way. So they do. And I mean, we followed a star here. We might as well yeah. listen to a dream on the right. road to take back home. Plus, so it took them a year to get there going the direct route. How long did the indirect route sure. take? Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, the direct route might... They they could have still gone back through Jerusalem, just not see the king, right? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah. But, 
So you'd think he would have like feelers out for if three three weirdos carrying gifts for a baby, they include a uh, myrrh that I think is toxic or poisonous right. in some or sense. Yeah, an embalming. An embalming. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what that's what frankincense and myrrh were used for for mm-hmm. embalming corpses. Um, the they were also they so were the, also extraordinarily expensive, which is why they yeah. were given as gifts. So these guys were probably don't have kids of their own. Probably not. <laughs> um, they could have just brought in a wooden camel and whatever other whatever toys, a, a hoop on a stick, a hoop and a stick. Yeah, that, but I mean, the reality, if you think about them following the star, the reality as we understand them is that they were probably astrologers. So yeah. these stars would have dictated what they did. Mm-hmm. So when this big ass star suddenly appears, of course they're going to be like, "We should go check that out." Yeah, and so they did. Um, but yeah, and then they went back. By another way, King Herod figures out they're not coming back, so he's like, it's murder time. Yeah. Um, and Joseph gets wind of this, and he's like, hey, Mary, we gots to go. Yeah. And? Angel's like, hey, get out of here. And Angel's <laughs> like, hey, Joseph, you gots to go. Yeah. And so they go to Egypt, and that is what I want to get the deepest into, mm-hmm. is the idea of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus as refugees, and the lengths to which I have seen so-called evangelical Christians mm. bending over re- backward recently to say, oh no, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus weren't refugees, because that would put them in the same category as the thousands of Hondurans and El Salvadorians and Guatemalans mm. at our southern border trying to come in and escape the disastrously horrible life that they're experiencing back home in two of those three places, thanks to regimes that this country, our country, put in place in the 1970s and 80s. Mm-hmm. And it's like, all right, people, Jesus was being directly targeted by the government. The government was committing genocide of babies. Joseph and Mary fled that genocide with their child to prevent him from being killed. They went to another country. They were, by definition, Mm -hmm. refugees from the government seeking to persecute and kill them. And it's like, you people are such racist bastards that you will dec- you will denounce Jesus' own refugee status to avoid having to compare him to brown people that you don't want coming into this country mm-hmm. who are trying to escape bad situations that we are responsible for. Yeah. In case you can't tell, I get a little pissed off about this bit. shit. I'd like to take a moment to welcome all of Joel Olstein's listeners that have tuned into us <laughs> thanks to that sponsorship deal. No, I agree with you, and I th- I think it's it would be interesting to look at um, sort of the mentality that or the the frame of mind that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph must be go uh, must be in when they are told that they not only must flee their home but they must flee to a country. That the only connection that his their people have to is being slaves yeah. in that country. Well, yes and no. Because if you yeah. remember, Jacob's family went to Egypt as refugees mm-hmm. from a famine to seek a better life. Which, you know, Jacob's son just happened yeah. to be conveniently there to set that up for them. Um but yeah, and then but, that, but then that ended in slavery. A couple of pharaohs later, yes, <laughs> Pharaoh did not remember Joseph, yeah. and so he enslaved the Hebrew people. So yeah, Egypt does have two connotations: one as a haven mm-hmm. for Hebrew refugees, the other as a place of slavery and persecution for the Israel Israelite people. So yeah, it would have been a huge gamble. Mm-hmm on their part to go to Egypt. But they did. That's how desperate they were. Mm -hmm. And again, you think about how desperate these people from these Central American countries are, that they know that they are going to experience some of the worst travel conditions of their life going through Mexico. Mm -hmm. That they know when they reach 
the California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas borders, that they are going to be actively disturbed, if you will, by Border Patrol, that they know that this country that they're going to has a president who has called them every terrible name in the book, and they are still so desperate Mm -hmm. that they are willing to go to this country. That is the kind of desperation Joseph and Mary would have had to find themselves in to take their toddler and go to this country that the last time their people were there, they were enslaved. Yeah. Yeah. That that was a safer place than their home. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, it's... It was a horrible situation for them to be in. I'm sure that the gold that they were just giving out of, out of the blue was helpful, but. Right. Um, but yeah, it could not have been easy. They spoke a different language in Mm -hmm. Egypt. They had a different ruler, even though it, technically, I mean, technically Rome, quote unquote, is still the ruler, but they're not Roman citizens, so they don't really have any rights within the. Within the empire, no. Within the federal empire kind of jurisdiction. Um, so they are, yeah, they are essentially in every respect in a foreign country, whether or not it's, it's, and whether or not everyone still pays taxes to Rome, they don't have any, they, they don't have the bill of rights in Rome. So they right. don't get, you know, like the, the say they would say in Nazareth. Sure. Yeah. And it, that's the big difference between them and say Paul. Yeah. Who was a Roman citizen and had all the privileges thereof. They were. They were Jews. Jews did not, unless they were born in Rome, did not have privileges of being Roman citizens. So, yeah, they, uh, I mean, just the extent to which they were putting their own lives and well-being on the line Mm -hmm. to protect this child who they, too, just like Simeon and Anna, they believed that this child was the child of God. And they were going to take great lengths to protect him, risk their own lives. So... Yeah, I'll I'll get off my soapbox. Well, well let me uh, now. The, uh, let me just uh, the, another theory I've had about this of why they flee to Egypt. Uh, not, I mean, obviously they're they're whether or not they're they're this actual per, this killing of the baby, the infants of two or lower two or lower actually mm-hmm. happened in Bethlehem. Um, they do they do live as refugees for several years, yeah. and it just says until King Herod dies, and we don't know how long that is within their lifetime. Um, let me, let well, me, it would have been before Jesus turned 13. That is true. Yeah, that's true. They have to get back to Jerusalem at some point. Uh, <laughs> um, but let me, uh, let me give you another theory I've uh, thought about before, which is that if, if we take the immaculate conception as something that actually happened because we're taking a lot on faith. So let's just pretend that did happen. Well, let, or, let's clarify here real quick. We're talking about the virgin birth, right? Because the Immaculate Conception is the idea that Mary was conceived without sin. Fair enough. Okay. So so the virgin birth, or let's just say a birth where Joseph is not the father. Let's just say the whole nine yards. The whole nine right. yards. Let's just go virgin birth right now. Okay. So Joseph finds out about Mary uh, being pregnant several months before, or several months into the pregnancy. They get married anyway, and they're en route to Bethlehem when she gives, or she, they're in Bethlehem when she gives birth away from their home. So if they go down, so if they come back, someone's going to put together, they've only been married like three months and they already have a new baby. Someone's going to put together either they've been together before, which is probably not likely, or she has a baby from someone else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in a small knit community, that's horrible. But if they go down to Egypt and let's say come back four years later, can you really tell the difference between a four year old and a four and a half year old? That's a good point. Especially if they maybe have another child as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that this, I mean, they could be running from an infant's letter. It also could be to hide the fact that not them think I'm maybe uh, divinely done so, uh, to hide the fact that this baby is not Joseph's. So they so, were also running from Galilean gossip, is what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. Well, I mean, Galilean gossip at the time could have ended in Mary's death. Yeah, that's, but, that's yeah. a good possibility. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I've always, uh, that was always, that's how I first interpreted this scripture. Not, uh, like years ago when I first started divinity school and we started, uh, people started being like, why don't you think about this and actually talk about it rather than just accepting it as literal truth or, you know. 
And this is what our friends Frank Tupper and Catherine Shaner did to you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, Frank Tupper, uh, I believe, uh, <laughs> was was more like Jesus ain't coming back. It was one of his famous, uh, one of his fun sayings in theology class. But <laughs> which is an interesting thing for somebody who is so deeply involved with the civil rights movement to say, considering yeah. a big part of the entire theology behind the civil rights movement is eschatological fulfillment. Yeah. But that is a topic for a whole different yeah. episode. We and, can probably spend three or four episodes talking about Frank And we, could, and we could easily, you know, we could just interpret it as we interpret so much scripture after the fact and say maybe he meant act as if Jesus is never mm-hmm. coming back. But honestly, who knows? Yeah. God I mean, knows. Jesus knows. That, that's about that's it. That's right. <laughs> Jesus said that he didn't know. Mm. Remember? Is that right? <laughs> and, um, late Luke? I think Luke 23, maybe? it's No, that's too late. That's like the crucifixion yeah. narrative. But late in the Gospel of Luke, he says, I don't know the time or day. Nobody mm-hmm. does but the Father. Yeah. You know, which, the Greek word that we have no direct translation for, so we decided in the whenever to say Father because patriarchal society. Yeah. But the idea is that only God the Creator knows yeah. the time and day. So, no, we don't know. Yeah. We don't know if, when. Whatever. Um, You know, sometimes we might say Jesus comes soon, but that's neither here nor there. So, yeah. So they flee to Egypt, and Herod supposedly kills a bunch of toddlers, which is awful. It's awful, but uh, from the little I know of uh, the original King Herod, it's not entirely out of place. Yeah, but uh, true. Yeah. Think about, though, the fact that in the last month, Two children have died in the custody of the federal government Mm -hmm. at our southern border. Mm -hmm. And it's hard not to make a comparison. Yeah. You know, we are so desperate to do something about these refugees, to keep them out, that we have imprisoned children in a manner where they end up dying. Yeah. And that's a pretty terrible thing. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, the last adult in the room who was advocating for things like that to not happen, Jim Mattis, decided mm-hmm. to resign and mm. uh, give a double middle <laughs> finger in the process, and in, in return yep. got fired. And, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you saw his departure memo today, but it was... I didn't see it today. It no. was an exhortation to the military to defend the Constitution at all costs. Yeah. Bless you, General Mattis. Yeah. And now they're going to have someone else that uh, agrees with everything the president yep. says. And if if Donald Trump would like to denounce us on Twitter and up our listener base, uh, we'd we'd very much appreciate that and love to be swimming in Casper mattress and Warby Parker ad endorsements um, anytime now. Um, no. <laughs> Are we forgetting the part where I'm an active duty military officer? You might want to blank that out from all. Of yeah. <laughs> He's not going to listen so, to it. One of his interns is going to so, listen to it. So and that's Ted, going to Ted can say those things. I can't. Yeah. You know, and, okay, sidebar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sidebar. <laughs> um, it's an interesting dynamic that I work within because mm-hmm. as a military officer, I am free to disagree mm-hmm. with the president and state as much. What I cannot do is – be adversely critical. You know, I can say I disagree with this, but I can't denounce the president. I can't, you know, openly defy Mm -hmm. the president. And I I can't, you know, engage in political activity in my capacity as a federal officer. Though that's, that's covered under the Hatch Act, and the other parts of it are covered under, you know, military chain of command and discipline. But again, I can... I can say that I disagree with him and say that I think he's doing the wrong thing as long as it's not a military matter. And Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly free to do that as long as it's clear that I'm doing so in my capacity as a private citizen, which I don't think there is any question that this podcast is in my capacity as a private citizen, right? Hopefully. The thing about that is I have so much more freedom Mm -hmm. when it comes to the interpretation of the gospel than I ever did in the congregational context. The Navy in... Title 10 of the U.S. Code, it specifically says a chaplain in the naval forces shall conduct religious service in the manner of his tradition, which as a Disciples of Christ minister, I am entitled 
to preach the gospel according to my conscience. And that is what the Navy requires by law that I do. At Gower Christian Church, it was never explicitly said that I could not be political, but it was implied. Mm -hmm. And even when I, I was never explicitly political, I was... Anything that appeared political was entirely in the context of the gospel, mm -hmm. but that was part of what got me dismissed there. When I was at Central Christian Church, I was explicitly told I could not be political in any way, hmm. including on Facebook. Wow. Those were words that were said to me. In the Navy... I am expected to <laughs> preach my conscience. The military has given me more freedom as a minister than the civilian church did. What does that say about our yeah. church? Now, off my second soapbox. Okay. Uh, oh, I was actually, uh, I was actually going to bring up another point about the Magi. Sure. When they, uh, so their whole, so to sum up their story, they go to King Herod, to find to see if he knows anything, he doesn't. Then they go to Jesus. Then they're told Herod is no good. Go home. Right. And so they go home. It, couldn't we extrapolate from that? Maybe pushing a little bit, but extrapolate that when you are doing something that you moral or that you should do, that you're pushed by God to do, try and do it through the proper channels. And if that does not work through corruption or inability of the proper channels then do it anyway. That's right. And ignore the proper channels if need be. Yeah. If you have to, you take down Silent Sam by force. Exactly. You do what needs to, what is right to do, no matter what. You do yeah. it, try and do it, do it through the, what is considered proper channels first, and then if that doesn't work, you just do it anyway. Yep. I well, see uh, I believe that was the entire impetus behind King and the Southern Poverty Leadership Conference, mm -hmm. or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, different organization, um, and their actions during the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. You know, they tried to do mm -hmm. things the quote-unquote legal way, and when mm -hmm. that didn't work, they said, to hell with this. Yeah. We're not going to stand by while our people continue to be oppressed in this so-called land of the free. Yeah. So, yeah. Try to do what's right via the proper channels, and if that doesn't work... Do what's right anyway. Agreed. Sounds like a good philosophy to live by. Agreed. Anyway. So, any closing thoughts on this politically fraught episode of Libations and Lectionaries? Um, do the right thing, people. Didn't Spike Lee make a movie called Do the Right Thing? I think he did. Yeah. I've never seen it. I've never seen it either, but I've heard it's pretty good. What was the last Spike Lee film to come out? Uh, Black Klansman was he involved in that? No, no, he didn't. He wasn't part of Black Klansman. I don't remember what the last Spike Lee movie. The last Spike Lee movie that I watched was uh, the Twenty Fifth Hour with Edward Norton. Uh, um, that was years ago. Uh, I vaguely anyway. remember. That. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is not libations yeah. and movies. This is damn it. Uh, this, stay tuned for a spinoff. We've podcast. talked about a bunch of movies yeah. on this episode, haven't we? Anyway, so do the right thing. Do the right thing. At all costs. And maybe check out that movie. Maybe it's good. Who knows? So anyway, um, yeah, I guess that's it. Okay. Yeah. Should we wrap up? I guess we should. Until next time. Oh, should we do I do have one plug. Oh, yeah, go real for quick. it. So number one, follow me on my Instagram account, Future Rev Ted. Uh, and number two, we actually mentioned her in this podcast, but on January 20th uh, at uh, Peace United Church of Christ in Greensboro, North Carolina, January 20th, uh, Professor Catherine Shaner will be uh, presenting a lecture at, I believe, 1 o'clock um, on homosexuality in the New Testament. I will be in class at Lexington Theological oh. Seminary in Lexington, Kentucky at that moment. Blow it off. <laughs> yeah. I will be in class for six days from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. I can't just blow Even it Even more off. reason. <laughs> no, I would I would fail. Even on the weekends? It is for one week, Ted. Dear God. It's a one-week class. It's, a, it's two classes over six days. Wow. Intensives. Um, well, if you're not Jimmy Gone, yes. please show up. <laughs> Peace UCC, uh, January 20th. Indeed. I have nothing to plug. That's oh, party, Dad. It's New Year's Eve! So, so um, 
Next episode is not going to be until the first week of Lent. Holy moly. So until then, everybody, have a very happy new year. May 2019 stop killing our favorite <laughs> celebrities because the last three years have been a disaster. Um, hang on, Betty White. Yeah. Hang on, Betty White. Hang on, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. For the love of God, hang on, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Until next time, though, have a drink and read your Bible. Bye bye. <laughs>